so my name is uh, Preeti Radhakrishnan. I am associate professor here at LaGuardia. I mainly teach anatomy and physiology, but traditionally I'm trained as a behavioral ecologist. Um, that's kind of what I do. I study, basically that's a fancy way of saying I study how bugs mate with one another. Um, so today's talk, I'm gonna step a little bit outside my comfort zone and talk to you a little bit about the neuroscience of creativity. In my talk today, um, I hope to convey, it's a very short talk, um, and I, in, that, in, in the few minutes I have, I hope to convey three important um, paradigms uh, within the realm of creativity. The first um, paradigm that I'm gonna talk to you about, the first example I'm going to illustrate is I'm gonna give you two, two of my favorite um, examples of individuals who I think show great creative potential. Um, one is Nikolai Rimsky-Korskov, and let me just play a little piece over here. Some of you might be familiar with that piece. Um, it's very, very popular. It's used very frequently. Um, it's actually a small part of a very big, grand opera. Um, but what I enjoy the best about this piece is that whenever I listen to it, it really conjures up memories of me being in India when I was very young with my grandfather out in the garden, um, smelling the lilacs, and I can almost hear the bees buzzing around me. This piece is actually called The Flight of the Bumblebees, as you might have guessed. You can hear the bumblebees as you listen to this piece of music. And what amazes me about these neuronal connections that I'm actually talking about is that just by listening to a beautiful melody, it can conjure up these grand, vivacious memories, um, even sights, sounds, and smells. And that's Amazing when you think about it at a neuronal level, at a mechanistic level. The second person I'm gonna to talk to you about is one of my favorite physicists. Um, his name is Feynman, Richard Feynman. And um, now most people love him, most, most physicists love him because he has this amazing ability to make physics extremely simple and straightforward. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little story about Feynman. When Feynman was young, when he was a young boy, he actually lived in Queens, and when he was a young boy, uh, he was out with his dad one day, and the two of them were, uh, they had a little wagon, a red wagon, and he had a ball in his wagon. And he was pulling this wagon along behind him, and he noticed that the ball in the wagon kind of moved to the back every time he pulled it, right? So he asked his dad, hey, dad, why, does, wh what's, why is that happening? Why does the ball move to the back of the wagon every time I pull it? And his dad looked at him and said, well, that's inertia, right? So he looked at his dad, Feynman looked at his dad and said, what's inertia? And his dad said, well, inertia is what scientists, is the term that scientists use when the ball goes to the back of the wagon. Um, and the reason why he said that was because back then, no one really knew what inertia was. There was no precise identification of what inertia was. Um, so Feynman actually spent most of his adult life um, in theoretical physics, trying to find the meaning for the word inertia. And this is kind of how I imagine Feynman in my mind when I think of him. I think of him as an artist. I think of him as a creative designer. Um, and all he did is create that little beautiful piece of squiggles that might look like to you, but it's actually a very, very complex mathematical equation to describe how subatomic particles move at a very small level. Look at it, it's beautiful. To me, that's beautiful. That's art and that's creativity. So all of these people look familiar to us, right? Um, some of us recognize some of them, especially this guy right here. Um, do you know who that is? That's right, everyone knows him. Do you know who this is? Aha! <laughs> Darwin, that's Charles Darwin, right? So he was the founder of um, the theory of evolution. Now, what do all of these guys have in common? They have a couple of important things in common. One 
is that um, they all had original ideas that were pervasive, right? They came up with something very, very unique and original that was pervasive and useful to an, an audience that was around them. Um, and that's kind of my favorite definition of creativity. There are several definitions of creativity. My favorite one being that creativity is a process of generating new ideas, original ideas, which have meaning and which have value, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that. Um, creativity is the, the process of creating original ideas that have value. And that's not my definition. Uh, that was actually defined by Sir Ken Robinson. He's like uh, one, of, one of the forerunners in uh, education, educational creativity theory. And I think it's a very simple and uh, precise definition of creativity. So the neuroscience creativity that I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm going to just skim the surface. I'm not going to get into details very much. Um, but the neuroscience creativity I'm going to talk to you about today was mainly pioneered, pioneered by this guy. Um, he, he's Professor Vincent Walsh, and he works in the UK, and he's done some really interesting research. What he's found is that if you were to look at the brain of an individual who has been going through a creative moment, there are a couple of characteristic features that you will identify with. One, and there, there are, it's broken down into three major processes, right? One is what we call preparation, right? None of those amazing minds that you saw um, ever went through a, a single most um, complex thought without going through many, many years of preparation, going through many years of what we call the mental grind. This preparation leads to an incubatory period, right? So you've done all the preparation, you've done all your homework, but then you need to give yourself a little bit of downtime, right? You need to think about things that are not so complex. You need to go into what, what they call a slightly meditative state in order for you to generate new neuronal connections between your, between in, your, in your brain. Um, now, this is very, very common, and I'll give you a, a brief idea of how this works. Many of us have, are, are familiar with this when you, know, you have a New York Times crossword in front of you, and you're tapping with your pencil, and you're trying to figure out the answer, right? You're tapping, 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 and it doesn't come to you. And then finally, uh, you decide, okay, let me take a break. Let me walk away and make myself a cup of tea. And you walk away, and as you're stirring the sugar into your tea, the answer just comes to mind, right? It just illuminates in your mind. And that is a very good example of incubation. Even though it's a small problem, it might be, not be terribly creative, but it's that aha moment where you realize the solution was so simple, why did I not see it earlier? And so that results in the illumination part, right? The aha moment that all of these guys have. But none of this would be possible without drive and emotion. Drive and emotion very commonly being called passion, right? So if you're not passionate, about what you truly believe in and what you love doing, then you're not going to really have that moment of creative ingenuity. So how do you, so, so what uh, Walsh did is he used uh, subjects and he asked them to solve a very, very uh, easy um, uh, language-based problems, right? So broken, clear, and I, and he asked them, okay, so how do you solve this problem? What do these words share in common, right? What word do these words share in common? And he basically figured out whether, uh, asked whether uh, the, the test subjects were solving this either by insight or by logic. Which pattern were they using? Insight is when you look at these three words and go, ah, the answer is glass, right? So broken glass, clear glass, eye glass. It just comes to you, right? However, when you use logic, you tend to go down the route, you go, okay, broken shoe, broken pencil, ah, broken glass. That's logic. And he found that most creative individuals solve these problems by insight. The, the solution just comes to them. And the reason why that is, is actually very interesting. So just before your moment of insight, so he wired them up with little MRIs, Right? And he studied their brain, brain waves and patterns. And this is kind of what the brain waves and patterns look like um, in different states. So he found that people who were having these moments of insight just before their moment of insight, this 
is what their brain waves looked like, right? In comparison to this, this is when you are in a normal state of just waking consciousness, right? When you're alert, this is what your brain waves look like. But in deep relaxation and light meditation, this is what your brain waves look like. This is what your brain wave looks like when you're in a very, very deep sleep, what's called um, transcendental sleep, right? When you're not a non REM sleep. So he found that in moments of insight, people had very, very, very calm uh, brainwave patterns. And I personally find this very ins uh, insightful because it really describes, and, and especially as a class, right? When you're, when you're in school and when you're studying and cramming really, really hard, subjects such as finance and accounting and anatomy that I teach, there's a lot of theory that you learn. But if you don't give yourself that downtime to incubate all of that information that you've learned, you're not really going to make those long-term memory connections and understand the information as well as, as you possibly should. So what's under all that bad hair? The answer is obsession and incubation, right? Whether it be that you're a punk rocker or a theoretical physicist, if you're not obsessed with what you love doing, you're not going to have a single moment of creative uh, ingenuity. So I'm going to talk to you about one of my passions, which is bio-art. I truly believe that art and science have a lot in common. Um, we just choose not to look at it sometimes. Um, so I try and look for examples of creative discovery using the natural world as inspiration. So these are schistosomes. They're parasitic flatworms. So what they really do is they suck on your insides, on your, on, on, they basically drink your blood in your gastrointestinal tract. That sounds really gory, doesn't it? But look at them. Aren't they beautiful? Yes, they are. They are truly beautiful. And the reason why is because this person has captured the most beautiful form of this parasitic flatworm. He's used fluorescence microscopy, different kinds of fluorescence microscopy, and very high definition microscopes to capture this image. These are bacteria which cause strep throat. You know that thing that really bothers you? It makes you hurt in pain? That's what it looks like. It's beautiful, right? So it's streptococcus. And this is a high definition scanning electron micrograph of the bacterium. This is Fabian Ofner. He is a theoretical physicist and a artist at the same time. Uh, what he does is he uses a high speed camera photography and oil paint and he uses centrifugal force, and he creates these beautiful, remarkable images of um, using, so he uses physics. He captures art through physics. My personal um, journey has also led me as an educator to think about creativity within the realm of education. How can I not? Um, so there are two ways in which I see this. One is teaching creatively. Those educators who are in the room with me um, teaching creatively, so what do, what do I mean by teaching creatively? I mean educators using their own creative skills to make ideas and content more interesting. Now, us at LaGuardia are continuously doing this. We are constantly trying to out-innovate and try and think of new ways of improving our pedagogy. Um, but the other, other way of thinking of it is teaching for creativity. And that means creating pedagogy which is designed to encourage creative thinking and reflection in our students. Um, I currently use two, two of these methods in my teaching at the moment. So I teach first year seminar, which is a new, uh, new discipline-based seminar. And what we're doing is we're doing what's called project-based learning or PBL, where we actively involve students in projects right at the beginning and have them learn critical thinking information all the way through. Um, and cross-disciplinary learning, like in the bio-art example that I showed you about, where you're thinking about the commonalities of science and art rather than the differences. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to take a step back and I'd like to end by saying that in the end, you know, in today's world, it's not really, we don't really, we, we're not really thinking about, thinking too much about what we know. Right? We're thinking more about how do we create new ideas? How do we invent and create new pieces of music? How do we design and innovate? How do we think creatively? And creativity 
is self-expression in many ways. It's storytelling. It's beautiful storytelling. It's creating images and pieces of work that we identify with at a very personal level and that other audiences identify with at a very personal level. But ultimately, creativity needs to stop being addressed as a fluency, and we really need to start thinking about creativity as the future. Thank you.